Administering Medications Lecture. Administering Medications. The following are the objectives for this chapter. Safety and Drug Administration. There are seven rights. Some people do say there are six rights to patient medication administration. The first right is the right patient. Confirm the patient's name or address before administering the drug. Oftentimes in the clinic, we are using name and date of birth. The right drug, check the label three times to confirm the drug dose and strength. Compare the physician's written order with the medication label. So we check the drug dose and strength. And for correctness, when we pull the drug off of the shelf or out of the refrigerator, and then we check it again when we are drawing up the medication. And then we check it a final time before we administer the medication to the patient. The right dose, perform pharmacology math to determine accurate dosage. If doses ordered does not match the drug label. The right route, clarify the route of administration on the physician's order. This means subcutaneous, intramuscular, or intradermal, or intravenous. The right time, check the physician's order to clarify the time of administration. Very important to maintain the proper drug therapeutic level. The right technique, be familiar with proper techniques of all routes of administration. So is it given at a 90 degree angle, 45 degree angle, or 15 degree angle? The right documentation should be done immediately after administration. We document the date and time the drug was given, the drug's name, strength, dose, and route of administration. We also document the site of administration, so was it the left arm or the right arm? We also include any patient reactions and details of any patient education regarding the drug. Oftentimes drug errors can happen. The first step in a drug error is for you to recognize that you made it. Then we seek the physician to report the drug error. Sometimes there is a reversal agent that we can give the patient. And then the third is seek a manager to file an incident report. Other safety tips, prepare a medication in a quiet, well-lit area. Never substitute drug dosages. Only administer medications that you have prepared. It is unacceptable to have one of your coworkers prepare a medication and then you administer it. You should have written medication orders by the physician before administering any medication. And discard any medications that are, have damaged labels or are missing labels. And then check the expiration dates before administration. Drug therapy is based on a holistic approach to patient treatment. It is important to obtain a complete and accurate history, details about the patient's health history, current and past, and use all medications. Negative responses to medications and drug allergies are all important to understand prior to administration. Observe the patient carefully after a drug administration of, for any reaction. A lot of times patients are Clinics will have a policy that patients have to wait 15 minutes after the time of an administration of an injection. Patient assessment factors. So age, weight, height must be documented to determine a therapeutic dose. Chronic conditions may affect the body's ability to metabolize and excrete medications. Patients must understand the drug regimen and may need family support and must be able to afford the medications. Approaches to special patient populations. Pregnant and nursing women should be at caution when it comes to drug administration. Some drugs are not recommended and may harm the fetus. Be sure to give correct dosage to children. All children dosages are done by weight in kilograms. 
Be aware of metabolic rate in older patients. As we age, our metabolic rate decreases, which can lead to a buildup of chemicals in our body or a buildup in the medications that we are giving those patients. Assessment of the patient's environment. Patient surroundings affect the success of medication therapy. Administration of certain medications requires the presence of a physician. There are some drugs that are started in the hospital due to their potency and ability to call, cause harmful effects to patients. Because of the risk of anaphylactic shock, allergy injections should not be given unless a physician is in the facility. Emergency drugs must be available to counteract any adverse effects that might occur immediately after administration of a medication. It is important to have a crash cart available and that's where you will find your emergency drugs. The most common types of emergency drugs are Arenadrix often in this class is epinephrine, and then our anticholinergics, which usually consists of atropine bronchodilators for asthma and histamine blockers for severe allergic reactions. Suggested questions for gathering medication information. What physician prescribed drugs are you currently taking? Do you take any over-the-counter drugs on a regular basis? What medications have you taken over the past six months to a year and why? Do you regularly use any alternative or herbal products? If so, what are they? If they are taking these types of products, it is important to list them on the medication list. It is important that patients take their medications as prescribed, so focus on a few questions and how they are currently prescribed. Drugs are taken. Some other questions. Where do you store your medications at home? Do you check the expiration dates on the containers? Can you tell me why you are taking the prescribed medication? A lot of patients do not know why they are taking a certain medication, and they will oftentimes ask you as a medical assistant, what is that medication for? So it's important for us to know. Do you use the same pharmacy to fill all your prescriptions? It's important to stress to patients to use the same pharmacy. This helps keep track of all prescribed medications, especially for interactions and sometimes pharmacists will call the physicians and say, hey, this has a severe interaction. Are you sure you want to prescribe this? So it helps in catching those sorts of things when medication lists become long. Drug forms and administration. So solid dosage forms are tablets, capsules, and lozenges. Tablets are usually coated, often called enterocoated, so it can be absorbed later in the digestive system, such as the small intestines. Capsules may be timed release. Liquid and oral dosage forms, there's syrups, suspensions, gels, extracts, and fluid extracts. Liquid oral dosage forms, we have syrups, which are solutions of sugar and water flavoring medicinal substances. Suspensions are insoluble drug substances contained in a liquid, which consists of emulsions, which is a mixture of oil and water that improves taste. Gels and magmas are minerals suspended in water, and it is important to shake these before use. Fluid extracts combine alcohol and vegetable products and are more potent than tinctures. Tinctures are alcohol preparations of soluble drugs or chemical substances. Extracts are very concentrated combinations of vegetable products or chemicals and are very strong. Elixirs are aromatic, alcoholic, sweetened preparations. Elixirs and tinctures are very similar. The only difference is that elixirs are sweetened. It is important with liquid dosage forms 
that we read the dosages after being poured on a flat surface. So bending down to that flat surface and reading at the point, at the lowest point of the meniscus. It is also important to keep the label in the palm of the hand just in case those liquid forms drip over the side and inhibit our visibility of the label. Here's a picture of a pill cutter. Pills should only be split in half. They should never be quartered. And here is a picture of a liquid medicine dropper. Mucous membrane forms of medications. There is rectal administration, which is done via installation or insertion. This form is for rapid absorption into the bloodstream and is useful in patients that are nauseated, have vomiting, or unconscious. There are also suppository forms that can be used. Vaginal administration used to treat local infections, best administered with the patient lying down. Oral administration consists of our sprays, swabs, sublinguals, and our buccal tablets. They treat local infections or pain relief. There are also many other things that our oral medications treat. Nasal administration is given via insulation or spray and is used for local effects but may get into the bloodstream fairly fast. So it's important to use this with caution. Topical forms, we have lotions, which control itching. Dab, it's important to dab with a soft cloth. Liniments have higher portions of oil than lotions. They are volatile and can, with the active ingredients that may be added. Ointment is a semi-solid medication containing bases such as petroleum removed from jar or tube with a tongue blade to prevent contamination. And then there are the transdermal patches which absorb thro slowly through the skin to create time-release systemic effects. There are a couple different types of transdermal patches. We have our nicotine patches. We have our pain patches such as our lidocaine patch or our Other pain meds um, should be applied to the site of pain or nearby. And then we also have our birth control patches, which can get wet. You can rotate the sites and it is important with all patches to avoid scarred areas, areas of burns, open wounds, that sort of thing. Pain patches and the nicotine patch should not get wet. Parental medication forms. The ampule contains a single dose of medication. We rarely see these in the clinic anymore. Oftentimes the ampules are glass and we are breaking off the top and then drawing the medication. It poses a hazard to employees, so this is why we rarely see it in the clinic. Single dose vial. Needle needs to be put on the stopper for the medication to be withdrawn. Multi-dose vial contains enough medication for multiple injections. Usually there's about 10 doses in a vial. Pre-filled syringes or cartridges are packaged units of medication ready to administer. Needle gauges is the diameter of the lumen size. Our common needle gauges for an intramuscular injection we will have a needle gauge from 21 to 23. Subcutaneous, the common gauges are 25 to 27. And the gauge for intradermal are 27 to 28. Needle length varies based on area of injection. 
If we are giving an intramuscular injection, this can range from anywhere from one to three inches, typically a deltoid injection or a vastus lateralis injection will be a one to one and a half inch. If we are giving an injection in the dorsal gluteal, we may need a two to three inch needle to reach that muscle layer. Other needle lengths, subcutaneous usually uses a 5 eighths inch, and intradermal usually uses a 3 eighths inch length needle. Sometimes when patients are a little bit larger and we're trying to reach that subcutaneous layer, we will use a little bit longer than a 5 eighths inch needle because we need to get past that dermis layer. So sometimes we will use up to a 1 inch needle. Syringes have different parts, the barrel, flange, plunger, and tip. Special syringe units, they don't require needle disposal and are used by patients at home. We also have syringes that now retract the needle up inside once the injection has been given. So here is a picture of our needles. We have the point right here, the bevel is right here, and then you have the lumen. And then on the right, you have the lure lock tip, the barrel, the flange, and the plunger. Disposable syringes need to go in a rigid puncture-proof container, also called a sharps container. We have Novolog pens and EpiPens. Novolog pens or insulin pens have changed in the recent years to be where they can be kept at room temperature. They don't always have to be refrigerated. Steps for an EpiPen, pull back the gray end of the auto injector, firmly press the black tip on the outer aspect of the thigh and hold in place for 10 seconds. Remove the EpiPen and massage the injection site for a few minutes to help with absorption. Patients should still call their physician and go to the emergency department for follow-up care. Signs and symptoms of anaphylactic reaction are hypotension resulting from systemic vasodilation, hives or uticaria, Difficulty breathing or dyspnea resulting from bronchoconstriction. Difficulty swallowing as a result of edema. And vomiting and diarrhea. It is important to follow your physician's orders. Check the order and the label during administration. Adhere to the seven rights throughout the procedure or six rights. Provide the maximum safety and comfort to patients and try and do the least, and we do this to obtain the least painful when done quickly. Never give injections near blood vessels or scar tissue. Guidelines for parental administration. Use a professional approach and explain what you are doing. Small talk can keep the patient's mind off the procedure and the injection. Never tell a patient that it will not hurt. It destroys your credibility. Make the patient as comfortable as possible and allow privacy. Never allow the patient to stand during the procedure. Keep the syringe unit out of the patient's sight as much as possible. Oftentimes when I'm giving injections, I will hide the needles and syringes behind my back as I walk in the door. Always wear disposable gloves. Immediately after the injection, cover the contaminated needle with the syringe safety device and dispose of the sharps container. Never recap a contaminated needle. Always use the safety device provided. Sanitize your hands before and after the procedure and provide patient education. This would be our VIS sheet if you're giving an immunization. And document the complete details of the procedure and the immunization. 
Intradermal injections are given within the skin layers. Intradermal sites are used for allergy testing or they are done for TB or PPD testing to test for tuberculosis exposure. Antibodies move to the site if positive and will cause swelling or induration. And induration is a large hardened reaction. The PPD test will need to be read within 48 to 72 hours. It cannot be read before 48 hours and it cannot be read after 72 hours or it will be considered invalid. Anyone with an induration of 15 millimeters or greater is considered positive. A positive reaction does not necessarily mean that you have active TB. You could have latent TB and will require other testing. Best sites of injection include forearm, upper chest, or back. Generally we say the anterior part of the forearm and we try and stay away from blood vessels. When we are giving intradermal injections, we usually use the anterior part of the forearm that is free of scar tissue, moles, birthmarks, warts, tumors, excessive bruising, and bones. It's important to note we never aspirate when we give an intradermal injection. We only aspirate with intramuscular and um, subcutaneous injections. Subcutaneous injections we give between the epidermis and the muscle into fatty areola layers called Oedipus tissue. Small doses of less irritating drugs are generally given this way, meaning less than 2 milliliters. The angle of insertion is 45 degree angle for multiple daily injections, rotate sites to prevent tissue damage, and keep a rotation record. It's important to aspirate with subcutaneous injections in case we enter into a blood vessel. If you aspirate and blood comes into the syringe, it is recommended that you and pull out immediately and do not give the injection. Subcutaneous levels or subcutaneous injections, we need to get beyond that dermis layer and into the subcutaneous layer, but not quite as far as the muscle layer. So sometimes in our larger patients, we will use longer than a 5 ace needle, but generally speaking, on most of the population, we would give a subcutaneous injection with a 5 8 inch needle. Sometimes we give injections on a daily and sometimes multiple times during the day. Typically these are our insulin users. Insulin is given in units, not milliliters. There is an insulin unit syringe and usually they come in U dash 100 syringes is how it's documented. These are given with a subcutaneous needle, however insulin injections are always given at a 90 degree angle in the subcutaneous layer. Typically insulin injections are given in the stomach or in the thigh or also in the arm. If you want a more rapid response with insulin, you would give it in the arm or the leg if you give it into the stomach, it takes a little bit longer to reabsorb. With insulin injections, you do not aspirate. If we do hit a blood vessel and we do inject that medication into the bloodstream, that just means that it will act faster in the patient's body. It is important to note also that we do not rub sites with insulin injections. Intramuscular injections, given if a drug would irritate the subcutaneous tissue, more rapid absorption is desired, large volumes of medication is to be injected, angle of insertion is 90 degrees, typically we are giving these injections in the vastus lateralis, dorsal gluteal or deltoid muscles. We always aspirate with intramuscular injections. It, the, 
Intramuscular injections, as you see here, is a 90 degree angle to get all the way through the dermis and subcutaneous tissue. And here shows the sites of the vastus lateralis, deltoid, and the gluteus medius muscle. Deltoid and vastus lateralis sites, deltoid muscle is the muscular cap of the shoulder is located at the top of the upper arm. It can only hold about one to two mLs of medication and usually we do not inject viscous medications such as penicillin or Depo-Provera into this muscle. It's a fairly small muscle to absorb that thick viscous medication. Injection sites is two fingers beneath the chromial process. Vastus lateralis as part of the quadricep group of the thigh is safest IM injection for infants or actually any child under the age of five. Usually when children come in for their five-year-old shots prior to kindergarten, we are giving their immunizations in the vastus lateralis. A lot of times their deltoid muscle is not large enough to give that amount of medication in that muscle. Fewer nerves and blood vessels are at this location and one hand width below the proximal end of the greater trochanter in adults is generally where we want to give this medication. You want to give this injection in the vastus lateralis in the upper quadrant but we want to stay away from that greater trochanter. So here is a picture of the approximate site of injection. So two finger widths below the chromium process. We are away from the arteries down here and the ligaments. You want to stay away from the, the shoulder joint. Here is a picture of where we would give the vastus lateralis injection. The greater trochanter is up here. So we would do it in the upper quadrant of the vastus lateralis. You don't want to get too close to the knee, but you do not want to get too close to the hip. If you are giving multiple injections in the vastus lateralis, it's important to keep injections one to two inches apart. Dorsal gluteal and ventral gluteal sites, we are giving this injection into the gluteus medius muscle. Dorsal gluteal region is the traditional site for deep IM injections. Common sciatic nerve injuries occur at this site and it is typically discouraged, but it is acceptable in adults if care is taken to locate the exact site. Ventral gluteal in central Wisconsin particularly is a lot more common and it does use a greater muscle mass than the deltoid. It is free of major nerves and blood vessels and is considered both safe in infants and adults. For children you would use a one inch needle whereas for an obese adult you would use a two and a half to three inch needle to reach the depth of the muscle. So here's a picture of where you would give each of those injections. So you want to make sure that you Feel for the iliac crest first, and then we also feel for the, the bony process where the spine comes in, and then you pick a site in between the middle of there, typically. A little bit easier landmarks to find are your ventral gluteal, which is you find the anterior iliac spine, the pointy process of that hip, the very front of your hip, and then the iliac crest, which is the top portion of the hip, and then you make a triangle, and then you aim for the injection site to be in the middle of that triangle. Z-track intramuscular injections typically are given, for given in the case of medications that stain the skin, such as iron or B12. What happens is we displace the upper tissue laterally before the needle is inserted. We palpate the site using anatomical correct markings and localized injection sites visually. We insert needles into the anatomically correct location 
and slowly release the medication into the deep muscular tissue. Principles of intravenous therapy. Intravenous therapy is used when a drug needs to work quickly. It goes directly into the bloodstream. Due to rapid action, any mistake can be very dangerous to a patient. Regulations strictly define who is qualified to perform these tasks. Typically, medical assistants are not giving intravenous medications or putting in IVs unless they've had special training or it's required for their specific department, but then they are put through additional training within that medical facility. Intravenous terminology, we have isotonic solutions which contain the same salt level as normal body fluids, used for patients who need replacement fluids, glucose, and electrolytes. Hypertonic solutions contain higher levels of sodium chloride than in body fluids. Higher levels cause in extracellular fluid to shift from cells into bloodstream. It is used to reduce edema and can increase blood pressure. Hypotonic solutions contain less salt than the body fluids, shift fluids from the blood vessels into the interstitial space around the cells, used to maintain fluid intake when a patient does not require electrolytes. So a lot of times if you have a patient who is very dehydrated from nausea and vomiting and diarrhea, we would give an isotonic solution to help balance out those electrolytes that they are missing from that sickness. They said types of fluid of IV therapy. So this shows our hypertonic solution and then our isotonic is here and then our hypotonic. So you can see what it does to a blood cell. Dangers of intravenous treatment, poor aseptic technique can result in infection or inflammation. Localized phlebitis or clot formation at the injection site can lead to a thrombus formation or a systemic infection. Infiltration occurs if a needle dislodges and fluid escapes into the surrounding tissue. Fluid overload can, cause, can be caused by too rapid of infusion of solution which is particularly dangerous in patients with heart failure. They can't, they can't withstand that overload, that rapid overload in fluid. Medication errors can be taken, cannot be taken back. Sometimes there are reversal agents, but a lot of times there is not. Intravenous equipment, all equipment is sterile, individually packed and disposed of. Skin cleansing solutions, include betadine or chloroprep, needle or catheter tubing with a spike at the end, sterile dressing and IV fluids, tourniquets, disposable gloves, biohazard waste containers, and IV poles are all necessary equipment. So here's a picture of an intravenous cannula. A lot of times there are catheters that cover the needle and this is oftentimes pulled back when we are going to insert. Plastic adapters, we have the stem, there's always a needle cap and wings kind of like when we do um, our butterfly phlebotomy. Roller clamps shows you when it's open and then when it's closed. Preparing the solution, insert the spike at the end of the IV tubing into an ordered fluid bag. You always must have an order prior to administering. Drop the orifice leading into the drip chamber and determines the size of the fluid drops. Rate drops fall into the chamber and through a filled tubing into a patient, which is regulated by compressing the roller clamp on tubing into a number of drops per minute prescribed as falling into a drip chamber. The distal end of the tubing is connected to the needle or catheter after the needle is in place. 
We will show you this equipment and how it is hooked up in class. The role of the medical assistant in intravenous therapy is to follow state practice acts, gather comprehensive health history, weigh the patient and monitor vital signs, watch for signs of phlebitis and infiltration, monitor equipment for problems, watch for too rapid of infusion of fluids, and document all necessary information. When you are monitoring vital signs on a patient with IV therapy, it is important to remember not to do a blood pressure on the arm that the IV is in. Patient education, be sure the patient understands how to take the drug and its purpose. Reinforce the physician's information or clarify certain aspects. Explain importance of the following medication orders. Explain expected results and any possible side effects. Instruct the patient to take all of the prescribed medication on time. Educate the patient about national associations of retail druggist rules regarding old medications and how to dispose of them. Legal and ethical issues, follow the physician's orders exactly as written. If questions, ask for clarification before you proceed. Prevent errors by following safe practice procedures. Implement the seven rights and perform the three drug order and label checks. No complications and side effects. And patients come first, never risk giving incorrect medications.